Public Affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years. Following the money, what the Illinois State Treasurer says he needs to make sure you get every dollar coming to you. Plus rethinking who you hire. Are there potential employees you're forgetting in the cities? Dependable, reliable, consistent. These are job traits many an employer would look for, but what happens when you add the word disabled to that list? Why one group says you're making a big mistake by ruling out some of the best workers you could ever hire. But first, it's your money. One of the roles of the state treasurer is to be the guardian of money that's lost in limbo, whether it's cash and property left in safety deposit boxes or an insurance payout that no one knows about. And it's the latter that's getting attention these days. Joining us is Illinois State Treasurer Mike Frerichs, and let's start right there. First of all, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. You are pretty much uh, campaigning right now to get state lawmakers to override the governor's veto in regards to auditors. It doesn't sound that interesting, nope. but why is it so essentially important that you believe? Well, this is something we discovered when we came into office. There were some life insurance companies would sell people policies and after they died, wouldn't pay out the benefits to loved ones. We just think that's wrong. And my job in being in charge of unclaimed property, I think if they don't give that money to the beneficiaries, then it doesn't belong to them. Give it to us and we'll find them and track them down. And we're talking big money here. Well, we are talking about a lot of money, and I got to admit that you would think that this happens perhaps more often than most people realize, because yeah. you think of people that don't have extended family members, or or people who just my, I, I forgot that my husband had done that, and and then yeah. it's just lost somewhere in the ether. There are spouses who knew their spouse had a life insurance policy, but they lived a long time and they developed Alzheimer's, mm. and they forgot. There are parents who took out life insurance because they knew their young children needed that protection but they didn't expect to die young and their kids were too young to realize this. And so we fight on behalf of consumers of the state to get money that belongs to them and that's what we're doing with House Bill 302. All it says simply is life insurance companies have to keep the promises they made to their policyholders. They have to look back in their records to the year 2000 and if any of their policyholders have passed away and their loved ones didn't claim that money, they have to notify them something that's common sense to a lot of people out there. Unfortunately, the governor vetoed that bill, and now we have to override his veto. Well, right now, some people are saying, let the insurance company self-police themselves. They will do it, but you're saying more needs to be done than that. I would say they should do that. They have it. Of the unclaimed property turned over to our office, about 20% is turned over voluntarily. 80% is a result of our auditors going in and enforcing compliance. The governor wants to take away our ability to use these auditors, when they're the one tool we have to keep these companies honest. Now, you're talking about a great deal of money, too. I mean, when you're talking 80-20, yeah. that's kind of uh, something that people can't really grasp onto. I mean, it's a, a significant amount, but dollars and cents, how much does that add well, up? Well, in, in a five-year period, through audits of about 20-some different life insurance companies, we discovered over half a billion dollars, $550 million that was sitting with life insurance companies, but that was promised to the loved ones of their policyholders. We know that there are hundreds of millions of dollars more out there, and we want to get it to them. We want to make sure the life insurance companies honor the last wishes of the deceased. Now, this is a problem that we're seeing, of course, in Illinois, but Illinois is not the only problem no. state. I mean, this is occurring in state after state. It's a nationwide problem. Nationwide, they've discovered over $7 billion that the life insurance industry was holding on to, and that's not from all life insurance companies. We know there are probably billions of dollars more out there. That's why the life insurance industry fights this so hard because there's so much money at stake for them. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, what you are using is kind of outside auditors. It's almost a contracted position, and that's yes. pretty much what the administration doesn't like. Yeah, they don't like that, but every state in the country uses them. If his mandatory veto were allowed to stand, Illinois would be the only state in the union that prohibited these, and it would take away the one tool we had to enforce them. This actually makes it more efficient. Rather than 50 different states sending in their individual auditors to each company, uh, these outside auditors can come and represent multiple states. It's less intrusive on the businesses. What are you seeing as far as bipartisan support for this in the legislature? Because that's always a difficult thing to find in Springfield. We have had some bipartisan support. Unfortunately, the governor has strong sway amongst Republican representatives and senators. And in the past, they have been reluctant to override his vetoes. But I think after he broke his word 
to Republican legislators over House Bill 40. I think a lot of them now are rethinking their loyalty to the governor. Now, we were talking about a period of time that you can go back and look at this. I mean, the insurance companies don't have to go back to 1955 or anything like Correct. that. What, what is the time period, because you had mentioned it, what is the time period that you want these insurance companies and your auditors to be able to take a look so at? So originally, we wanted to go back as far as possible, because if they sold a policy to someone right. and said, we're going to be there for you, uh, they should honor that. But in some cases, those are old policies, they're written on paper, they're in file cabinets, they'd be tough to find. So our original legislation then switched to 1992. The industry said that is too far back for us, too much of a burden. We negotiated with them and we all realized in the year 1999, all of these businesses were worried about Y2K. They all updated their software systems and so we said, you have to go back at least to the year 2000 because we know you updated your software systems then. Now, you think it's doable. Obviously, the insurance company thinks it's onerous and it's obviously going to cause them more problems. What's the middle ground then? Uh, I, I don't think it's onerous. There is a, an electronic record of people who have died in this country. It's called the Death Master File. It's compiled by the Social Security Administration. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy today with electronic records to match them up their policyholders versus the Death Master File. And simply, if you see someone's name on both, it's a good sign you should reach out and notify their beneficiaries. But that's easier said than done because sometimes now you have to find these people that are deserving of this money and as you well know finding uh, uh, recipients of cash can be very difficult. It can be difficult but of that 550 million dollars we have tracked down uh, well over 300 million dollars and found the recipients and we're finding more every day. Do you think there's more out there? Obviously, well, they're, they're, I mean, what, what do you think is the percentage right now? I know there's definitely more yeah. out there. We can't know until they open their books to our auditors know exactly what's out there, but I think it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The other area that you're always well known for is, of course, the property that is left in uh, safety deposit boxes and, and, and the, the, uh, the reclaiming of that by uh, Illinois residents. That's been kind of your Santa in a suit almost in, in, this, per in, in this particular instance. Yeah, <clears throat> that's why we are involved with life insurance, because I believe that if someone buys a life insurance policy, faithfully pays their premium payments and dies, then that money no longer belongs to the insurance company, it belongs to their loved ones. But we bring in unclaimed property from lots of different, mm -hmm. lots of different ways. Uh, the last two years, we have reduced, through legislation, the burdens for families to claim their money. So the last two years, we've set records. Two years ago, we returned $155 million to people in this state. That was record. Last year, we increased to 159, and next year, we expect to break that record again. At a time when the governor is not paying our bills on time, um, isn't honoring all of our contracts, we take our responsibility seriously to get more money out there in the economy. I know that if we put money into the pockets of people here in the Quad Cities, it does a lot more good for the economy than it does sitting in a bank account in Springfield. You've got uh, resources at your website that can help people try to find some of the cash that, as you say, is rightfully theirs. Is that where people should start the yeah, process? They should start at IllinoisTreasurer.gov. Click on iCash and see if we have some money that belongs to you. Put your name, put your address in there. We find out one in four people who check have something for them, and the average amount is about $1,000. And it is interesting because I was looking, in iCash, you believe there's about $2.5 billion that's just sitting there looking for the rightful owners. Yeah, and we'd love to return it to people in the state if we can get it into Illinois citizens' wallets and purses, and they spend it at local stores. That just does a lot more good than it does sitting where it is now. I want to talk about another program that you have called Illinois ABLE, or IL ABLE, and it has to do with savings plans for the disabled. Tell me a little bit about the genesis of this and, and, and who it is definitely supposed to help. No. So we currently have a savings program for families when they send their kids to college mm -hmm. called Bright Start or Bright Directions. But there are parents out there who also want to give their kids a brighter future, but if they have severe disabilities, that may not be the path for them. Now, they still want to save. Currently, if their child is eligible for Social Security benefits, that's means-tested, means they can't have more than $2,000 in assets. So they can't leave their child in their will. They can't give them a lot of cash. They can't leave a house for them or they'll lose their benefits. But with Illinois ABLE accounts, if they save their money in an ABLE account, they can save up to $100,000 without jeopardizing their federal benefits. This is gonna make a world of difference for a lot of families out there. And this is an account that, to be honest, anyone can contribute to. 
I yes. mean, uh, uh, grandparents or aunts and uncles or, or friends and neighbors that want to help out a disabled individual with a savings plan. Yeah, so they can put, anyone can put money into this account in the name of someone with a disability uh, as long as they take money out for disability related expenses, and that's a lot of things, um, the growth in that fund is tax free. It really is a great program to be able to let parents save something extra, put something aside that they couldn't before. Have you seen a number of people accessing it? I mean, how do you hope that this does grow? Yeah, we have seen this growing. It's growing by word of mouth right now. Right. But I mean, I talked to one mother who said, I am scared of the day where I outlive my son. I almost thought I misheard her because nothing scares me more than outliving my daughter. But she says, I am the primary caregiver for my son. When I'm gone, who's gonna take care of him? And I can't really leave enough behind to take care of him. So with this account, it doesn't take away all her anxiety but it reduces the mm -hmm. fear that she has about that day. And once again, full details at the website, and you can get- It's IllinoisTreasures.com and click on ABLE. It stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience. I want to get into one other area, and you've heard it time and again, and that is the constitutionality of your office and the Comptroller's office, and do we really need both? Should one be abolished? Where do you stand on that? Because, I mean, you talk about, a lot of people in the public don't quite know what the comptroller or the treasurer does. <laughs> Leaves the treasurer, pays the bills when the comptroller yes. is more in charge in that area. I mean, when we're looking at a leaner and perhaps a better run state government, is it time to get rid of one of these constitutional offices to, by merging? Yeah, I think you could merge the two offices uh, for some responsibilities that are incompatible. You could take them out and give them to the Secretary of State or mm -hmm. the Auditor General. Uh, but I support that. I support giving the public a right uh, the, the right to decide what they do. Currently, the two offices are separate according to the Illinois State Constitution. It would require a constitutional amendment to change that, but I think the voters deserve, deserve to be heard. What do you see as it being streamlined then as? Do you see it as being a comptroller's office and no treasurer's office or the other way around? Well, in Florida, they combined some office and called the new one a uh, chief financial officer. You know, I think that most people out there have been part of an organization that, that has a treasurer. People understand what a treasurer does, uh, but really it's about making sure government is smooth and efficient uh, and is spending as little as possible while getting good returns and protecting the taxpayer dollars. State Treasurer Mike Fredericks, thank you so much for joining us. Jim, thank you we very much. We appreciate it. We're also facing some cooler temperatures, but the area music and theater scene is only heating up. But that's just one of the things that might interest you and your friends as you look for things to do out and about. Here's Laura Adams. This is Out and About for October 16th through 22nd. Hi, I'm Laura Adams. Cordova International Raceway gets spooky for their annual Halloween on October 21st, or bring the family to a Halloween trunk or treat at the Two Rivers Church October 22nd in Rock Island, or the TAS Trunk and Treat and Harvest Fest at the Apostolic Sanctuary in Silvis October 21st. Prospect Park in Moline is the site for their spooktacular on October 21st. Kids come dressed in costume, and the German American Heritage Center is holding a special sundown ghost tour October 21st at 10.30. Walk downtown Davenport and share stories of haunts, murders, and other notorious figures. Plus, there's a not-so-scary Halloween walk at the Quad City Botanical Center October 20th. Come dressed in costume and bring a flashlight. The Mad Woman of Charlotte continues at the Bruner Theater Center on the campus of Augustana through the 21st. And Irma Thomas, the Blind Boys of Alabama, and the Preservation Hall Legacy Quintet will perform at the Adler Theater on Saturday, October 20th. For student discounts are available. The Quad City Wind Ensemble presents British Band Classics, a performance featuring pieces written by British composers at Galvin Fine Arts on the campus of St. Ambrose on the 22nd. Ballet Quad Cities presents their scary and sexy production of Dracula at the Scottish Rite Cathedral on October 20th and 21st. And the Bucktown Review serves up some spooky Halloween antics at the Nice Warner Junior Theater on October 20th. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. Tristan Bushman is a Dixon area musician who released a new album last month. Next month, he's coming to the Quad Cities for a set of performances, but we want to feature one of his older songs, recorded about two years ago. Here's Tristan Bushman with Girl, You Done Me Wrong. Saying sorry didn't make it all right I'll still be laying alone tonight Now you're my darkness, you used to be my light 
saying sorry didn't make it all right. Being lonely didn't make it okay. I'm sick of hearing about all these shades of gray. Now I'm feeling like I. To stay, being lonely didn't make it okay. Oh, 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 girl, you done me wrong. You can see it in my face, and you can hear it in my song. Whoa. Saying sorry didn't make it all right. I remember when you shined so bright. No one can lead me home tonight. 'Cause saying sorry didn't make it all. Tristan Bushman, Girl, You Done Me Wrong. You can catch him at Kilkenny's in Davenport next month. He's to take the stage Friday and Saturday, November 17th and 18th. We've heard time and again that employers are having a tough time finding good workers, but sometimes they may not be looking in the right place. October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month, and this year's theme is Inclusion Drives Innovation. And joining us is the Executive Director of the Arc of the Quad Cities area, Michael Glanz. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Tell me why it's so important at least to have one month where you're really pushing to employers and the public the important contributions that the disabled can have in the workforce. Uh, it's just important because it's a way to get the message out there. Mm -hmm. It's a way to really push the conversation forward that people with disabilities really drive a diverse workforce. They drive a great workforce. They drive inclusion. Um, and it's just really good for employers um, to include people with disabilities in their workforce. Have you noticed as, that it's more of an eye-opener that once some companies uh, hire some disabled people, they're more welcoming to having disabled people in their workforce? Yes, I think once they bring in that first person with yeah. a disability and realize that a lot of what the supports that a person with disability need is not really that different than what a lot of employees need. And so it's, it's very similar supports and then they really improve the overall morale in the workforce and in the workplace. And there's a lot of benefits to hiring people um, with disabilities. Those includes, a, so it improves overall morale. There usually many times are people with disabilities are really um, consistent. They're consistent in showing up for work. They come to work, they're happy to be at work, and they love to do jobs that oftentimes other employees might not love to do, but they really take pride in their work and take pride in the work that they do every day. Well, and that's what we've heard time and time again is the fact that uh, uh, disabled people by and large are the ones that want to be there day after day after day, aren't necessarily grumbling about having to do some type of work, and, and, and it's, it's a critical part of the workforce of any company. Yes, yes, it's a, it's a very critical part of the workforce. It's a critical part of the, the workforce. Um, so we go out and try to get people jobs in the community, but we as an agency are also try to be a really great employer ourselves of people mm -hmm. with disabilities. And it's, I've always been touched by, we've got a, a person that 
in the Quad Cities um, travels two hours every day just to get to work for us. And that's amazing. And it's because their commute is extended because they have to go, they have to transfer bus lines, they're crossing state lines, and there's all the work that goes in that. And they um, use a wheelchair to support them in mobility. And so it's a two hour commute. And that's a commute you'd hear about maybe in the Chicago area, but you don't hear about here in the Quad Cities. Absolutely. But they love their job and the, what they do for us so much that they take the time to do that commute to us and, and home every day and spend four hours commuting. And that's just, that shows the commitment of people with um, disabilities and how they're just committed to the work they do and they are so proud of what they do and what they're able to do with us. We're talking about the employer and let's keep talking about the employee because mm -hmm. I mean for the disabled this gives you self-sufficiency and, and an ability to manage yourself as well as a great deal of pride I'd assume. Yep. So it really, it, it creates that independence and we believe at the Ark of the Quad Cities in that everyone should be included in the community and that everyone should be given the opportunity to reach their full potential in life. And we in, in that belief, a large part of that is being able to work and create and have, a, have a, com a community life that's just like anyone else. And a huge part of that is your work life. And so taking pride in that work life, taking pride in what you can contribute to the community is a big thing of what we do every day from the employee's perspective. And one of the big ways you try to facilitate more jobs, more employment for the disabled is by the use of your jobs coaches. Tell me yes. a little bit about that and, and, and how important that is to ARC. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so our job coaches, what they're, they're tasked with doing is um, meeting with the people they're going to be finding jobs for, really discovering what their strengths are, what their needs are, and what drives them and what they're really good at. And then what they do is then they go with them out when we find that job and we find that great employer that's willing to take that leap and employ them. They go out and then help train them on that job and ensure that they have the, the hard skills. Uh, mm -hmm. And oftentimes, so it's it's teaching just those hard skills about what you actually have to do in whatever job you're hired in. Hired in. But then they also have to teach those soft skills because we find one of the main reasons that sometimes our employees fail is really not because of those hard skills. They can do the job. Mm -hmm. It's those soft skills. So it's that socially interacting in the break room. It's those um, working with customers. And it's all those soft skills that go along with being a great employee that are sometimes a challenge because those are, those are really hard to learn. And so our job coaches are there to help them to learn that, to learn about the culture of the organization they're working for as well. Because you would think that some employers would shy away from that thinking, I don't have time to train in that area. And this kind of gets rid of Shall I say that excuse? Yeah, so yeah, it completely gets rid of that excuse because we'll send that job coach out with them to teach those skills and there isn't really that much time. The, it's you, everyone when they get a new job has to learn how to do that job and employers have lots of training programs. So we just take some of that information, help to ensure that the people we serve understand that information and know that. And then we ask those further questions and ensure that people, so it is they know about when to take breaks, they know about what the kind of culture is in that workplace and they can really fit into that culture. Because our end goal is that job coach is there um, until that person gets that job, but then we can fade away and what we mm -hmm. call is those natural supports come together. And those are the supports that any, any employee gets by building relationships with coworkers and knowing who to go to for certain questions, who you can, if you have issues at work, where you can go and where you can learn how to um, overcome those issues. Well, that would be critically important because you're giving kind of a safety net um, until they get acclimated, mm -hmm. which may take longer than some employees would have only because mm -hmm. they haven't been in the employment scene that long. And actually pulling on that really that safety net that you said and then describe, I think that does really describe what our services are. So we provide those services and then we try to fade away, but once that person has been connected to the ARC, then we really can be that safety net and mm -hmm. come back in. So sometimes people forget those skills or we might have to reteach them the skills they've known before and then we can come back in if the employer is having issues again. So it's, they can always um, call the ARC if they're having issues with the, the person we've placed there. Um, and then we can come back in and really engage that employee again. I mean, you become actually a part of their HR department. I mean, yes. you, you don't leave at all. Tell me, because there's such a wide spectrum of disabilities out there, of course, to what extent do you serve anyone who is classified as disabled? So we serve, uh, so yeah, so we serve a wide variety exactly. of people. So it's, we've got people with a lot of, we serve a number of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We um, serve people with physical disabilities. And, but what we want to focus is on what is that person's strengths. So whenever we're trying to get someone in the job, we focus on what are their strengths? What can they do in the workforce? And then we try to find that match. It's the same thing that, so actually to switch it, so it's the same thing that we do for an employer. When we 
come to an employer to talk about employing people with disabilities. We come to them asking what are their what are their issues on the flip side. What are the where are their weaknesses? And then we try to develop a solution using people with disabilities. So we really see ourselves as a workforce partner and providing workforce solutions for companies. Well, and you must have seen successes over the course of the years. I mean, I mean that's that's what brings you back to work day after day after day. Uh, are there a lot of success stories? I mean, how, how has placement gone? Is, is it, are we talking about hundreds of people in the Quad City area? There has been, so it's, the ARC has a long history and Absolutely. I can't really speak to, so we've been in the agency, or been in the community since 1952. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure I'm gonna miss a lot of that history because it's been there for so long. But I do know, I can speak over the last few years, what we've done is we've really put a lot of emphasis on this, on our, what we call our community employment program and trying to get people in those jobs in the community. So we've gone from where we were just getting, um, a few placements and we went to seven placements and now we're at 14 placements last year and then already this fiscal year which just starts for us in July so we're just three months really in we already have seven placements this year so we're looking at continuing to grow the number of placements and success stories we have of getting people in these jobs. Well and as we said once you get an employer that is amenable to this then it just seems to be easier because you're knocking down barriers in more than one way. Yes, and that's really, and that's, and that is what National Disability Employment Awareness Month is, is about. Is about knocking down those barriers, knocking down those public perception of what people with disabilities can do and where they should do it. Um, it's really that they should be doing it in the, the, in the community at normal jobs in the, within the community, and that's what this month is really about. Well, I know you have file cards that are filled with the names of employers, but if an employer hasn't been reached out by ARC, I mean, what can they do, an employer, to actually get the, the wheels rolling and perhaps hire somebody who has some disabilities that could be a perfect fit inside their company? Mm -hmm. So it, I think a great first step would be reaching out to the ARC of the mm -hmm. Quad Cities area, um, letting and asking what are your solutions? And what we would do is we would come out, ask those questions, what, um, what are you, what do you need? What do you mm -hmm. need as an employer? What kind of, what strengths do you look at? What kind of, what gaps do you have? Um, and we really want to work with that, whether that's that HR department, whether that's that hiring manager, whoever, to figure out what they need and then we can find that person that we have that can fit it. So we well, have- Tell me an employer who doesn't want to have that question asked and answered. Yes, and that's what we hope we can do is often is answer that question. And we can answer that using people um, with disabilities. And we've got, uh, it's one of the largest untapped workforces out there. So you've got employment, depending on what numbers you look at, you've got unemployment for people with disabilities is 60% plus. Mm -hmm. And so it is a large untapped workforce that people can tap into and figure out how to use in their um, agencies. Michael Glanz, the Executive Director of the ARC of the Quad City Area, thank you so much for joining us. Very easy to find their website and get more information that could benefit your company as well as your co-workers. WQPT is also doing its part to support the military men and women in the cities who are serving our nation. We call it embracing the military, and they're getting ready to scare you at Quarters One. You can make your reservations right now for the Quarters One Ghost Hunters Dinner Tour. It starts at 5.30 Friday, October 27th with, get this, prime rib and chicken buffet at the Arsenal Clubhouse. Afterwards, the Rock Island Paranormal Society is offering a tour of the historic Quarters One house on the island. Most of you will come back. Contact Army MWR office to get details and to make some reservations. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Public affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by the Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years.